Okay, so again, uh, example of stochastic matrix. 100,000 people on an island, 500 are sane, 500 are demented. Uh, there's a lot of volatility in those categories between sane and demented. So that any given month, 10% of the sane people will become demented and 20% of the demented people will become sane. Uh, and we're talking about 10% of the people who were sane at the beginning of the month will at the beginning of the next month uh, be demented. And 20% of those who are demented at the beginning of a month will be sane at the end of the month. Okay, now how does this work out? How many sane and how many demented do you have at the end of the first month? Well, you could kind of draw a picture. You got um, You got sane, you got demented. Uh, you've got 500 here and 500 here, but 10% of 500 is 50. So you're going to have 50 going over to here, and 20% of 500 is 100, and you're going to have 100 coming back over here, which means that you're going to lose 50. Well, you're going to gain a net total of 50 sane people, and you're going to lose a total of 50 demented people. So that at the end of the month, you have 450, sorry, 550 sane and 450 demented. Well, in the next month, 10% of these go over here and 10% of these come over, 20% of these come over here. And that's gonna be 55 that go over here and 90 that come back here. That's a net change of 35. So you're gonna have 585 sane and 415 demented. Now you can continue this process, okay? And you could easily continue to calculate the numbers of sane and demented. You could write a simple computer program to do that. So you could predict as far in the future as you like, or you can use a matrix model. Okay, so matrix model uh, is this. Just to do the same calculation we did at the beginning. And let's do it actually with the 550 and the 450 calculation that gets from here to here. Uh, the matrix that we use to multiply by this column vector which represents the population uh, configuration is going to be this. Um, if, okay, there's another way of calculating this. If 10% of our same become demented, that means we retain 90% of the same. Okay. Uh, and if 20% of our demented become sane, that means we retain 80% of those who are demented. So 90 at the end of the month or beginning of the next month, 90% of those who were originally sane will still be sane, and 80% of those who are demented will still be demented. So we want to think about that. And now I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase. I'm going to say, okay, 90% is 0.9, and 20% is 0.2. I multiply the number of sane by 90%, and then I add 20% of the number of demented, and that gives me the number of sane in the next month. Okay, so here I'm multiplying the number of sane by 0.9 and the number of demented by 0.2. When I do that, and you can easily do the calculation, it's gonna give me my 585. Again, this represents 90% of the sane and 20% of the demented, and that's going to equal the number of sane in the next configuration, the next month. Then, uh, to get the number of demented in the next month, I multiply the number of sane by 10%, because 10% of the sane become demented. And I multiply the number of demented by 80%, because 80% of the demented stay that way. So now I have 
0.1 here, that's 10% that multiplies the number of same. And 0.8, 80% multiplies the number of demented. And that is going to give me uh, my 415. Okay, so we call this the transition matrix. And we note, and this is a characteristic of stochastic matrices, that the columns both add up to one. And that's the test of a stochastic matrix. It's a square matrix whose columns add up to one. Okay, well, if we now want to calculate from our beginning number, we want to calculate this number. Okay, so. The two months I'll just say the configuration which by which I mean the column vector represents the number sane and the number demented is going to be this. In parentheses, I've got the calculation I would do on the original configuration. And clearly, 0.9 times 500 is 450. 0.2 times 500 is 100. That adds up to 415, uh, to five, sorry, to 550, OK? And then 0.1 times 500 is 50, 0.8 times 500 is 400, 450 is 450. So this calculation gives me this result. And then when I multiply by this, well, that's gonna be uh, the same as this calculation. Well, but associativity of matrix multiplication, this is the same as This product and then the same as this. In other words, to get the number in the second month from the initial number, I can just square the stochastic matrix and multiply it by my population configuration. I'm going to get the result. And that's going to, again, that's going to give me, again, this 585 or 15 that we get from this calculation. If I want to know what the configuration is after 100 years, multiply by the 100th power or 100 months. And that's going to equal to a very high level of precision, 666.66 and a bunch of sixes.
Now, the reason we know this Well, yeah, that, that, don't have time to do that. Okay, uh, we can verify that this will be two thirds of a thousand. This will be one third of a thousand. Okay, because ninety percent of this is equal to twenty percent of this. Okay, and I said that wrong. Ten percent of this is equal to twenty percent of this which means if you had these two numbers, the 10% here that go over to here will exactly balance the 20% of this that comes over here. Okay, the 10% of the sine will equal 20% of the mode. Okay, with this, configuration. Well, that's a quick introduction. Um, when we learn about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we can actually prove, and we will do it, why this converges the way it does. Okay, now, I normally always start the course with this example just to give you a, an overview of the things you can do with later algebra. Uh, but since we're using the web assign, uh, I'm gonna kind of stick to its approach. Okay, that's an example of a stochastic matrix. This is the prettiest board, and I don't think there's anything I can do about it. Let's see if that makes any difference. Kind of does. Anyhow, we're going to have to use it. Don't have time for it to dry. It's you know, 43 degrees in here. Uh, take it 10 minutes at least. Okay. Well, that's one topic. Now, one other example of a stochastic matrix. Uh, suppose that the It's kind of a rough board here, but we're going to use it. Okay, so the stock market. Uh, and here's the situation. If it's up today, then we're going to say there's a Sixty percent chance that it's up tomorrow. And twenty five percent chance that it's the same tomorrow. Now, it's very likely stock market will be exactly the same tomorrow as it is today. So by the same, I mean, just about the same, and we could define that. Let's say it doesn't change by more than a half percent, and that'll be same. More than half percent is up, uh, and uh, more than half a percent down is down. So within half a percent is the same, you know, or whatever. That isn't important for the model. However you define same, and a 15% chance that it's down tomorrow. Now that would be a market that's, that, you know, it's very much uh, a bull market. Okay? Things are really going up this week for some reason. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna do a pretty weird model here. If the same today, we're gonna say, that there's a 70% chance that it's down tomorrow. Ten percent chance that it's up tomorrow, and a twenty percent chance 
that it's same, and I should probably keep these in the same order, 20% here, 10% here, this will be the same. And this will be up. Okay. Um, and then, If found today, again, this is very weird and unrealistic model. We're going to say that there's a eighty percent chance same tomorrow. You can't read that, but you know what it says, and a. Fifteen percent down tomorrow. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and a five percent that's up tomorrow. Okay. Well then, our transition matrix. Gonna look like this now. The numbers here will be the number will be the probability that's up. Probability the same. Probability that it's down. Okay, let's look at these percents. Sixty percent chance that it's up tomorrow. So the first row of my column matrix here, of my configuration matrix is gonna be the number that's up. So I wanna put the numbers here that I multiply by the up, the same, and the down, the probabilities that I use to multiply the up, the same, and the down. Um, we'll have to go in this row. So we'll see in a minute. Okay, 0.6 here. 0.25 here, 0.15 here. Okay, this means that if I multiply this row by this column, I get 60%. Uh, there's a 60% chance that if it's up, it's going to be up tomorrow. A 25% chance if it's the same, it's going to be the same tomorrow. 15% chance uh, that if it's down, it's going to be up tomorrow. Uh, and it's not 15, it's five, so 0.05. Okay, then I calculate the number of the, the probability it's gonna be the same tomorrow is gonna be uh, 've got these in reverse order. I should have had the up here just to keep things easy, but I've got to multiply uh, the probability it's up by the 10%, so it's 10% and 20% and 70%. Okay. Then I multiply by these percents, and I didn't keep these, <coughs> I didn't leave these in the same order, up, same, down, but I can identify it. 5% up, 0 0.05, 15% the same, no, 80% is going to be the same, so I should have kept them in order, and um, Back here, when I did this 0.15, I was looking at this number instead of this number. Just caught it out of the corner of my eye and took, okay. So this should have been 15 and uh, the 0.05 is here, the 0.80 is here and the 0.15. No, got those in the wrong order. You gotta be careful. Should have been more systematic. Um, okay. So 
this is going to multiply the probability that it's the same and that probably the, the this row is going to tell me the probability that it's down tomorrow. So this row is going to multiply these things and give me the probability of down. So there's a 0 0.05 probability that if it's up, it's going to be down. Then I want to multiply this number by the number by the probability that it's the same. This probability by the probability of the same. That would be the 80%. And uh, the 15% chance that it's down, we're going to be down. There's a point 15. And now there's my transition matrix. And what good is this transition matrix? Well, Is up today, then the up same down configuration is 100% chance that it's up, 0% chance that it's the same or down. So that's going to be one, zero, zero probability that it's up. If it's up, the probability that it's up is one. And uh, yesterday, the stock market was up. Okay. So if we start yesterday with this assumption, we're going to be able to predict the probabilities that is going to be up the same or down today. And then we could multiply whatever set of probabilities we get by the same matrix to find out the probability that it's going to be up or down or the same tomorrow. So let's just do that for a couple of steps. So we do the matrix. Now something's wrong here. And my logic is totally wrong. These should be columns. And my interpretation is wrong. Somehow I magically expected these columns would add up to one, but it's the rows that add up to one. So it's not a stochastic matrix. It's not a valid model. But if you put these things in columns and then interpret things a little bit differently over here, uh, it's going to work. And I apologize for that. I don't have time to fix it or re-explain it. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to move on uh, to the next topic, um, and I'll post a video on this a little bit later today that'll correct what I did wrong here, okay? Um, okay. Okay. Well... You'll find that the homework is going to consist of a couple of problems that ask you, is this matrix stochastic? And you have two answers, yes or no. So everybody's going to get it in the second try if they don't get it in the first try. So you're automatically going to have uh, a couple of problems that are correct. But then it asks you some things about two by two transition matrices, stochastic matrices, um, as you do some calculations, calculate what happens after a couple of transitions. Um, it's going to multiply the matrix twice uh, by the, the, the starting configuration. And then you have, uh, I, I think, a couple, well, at least one, probably two, um, to give you situations uh, where you have three categories, sort of like the one I did there. And it's reasoned out very similar to what I did, uh, but I, I got the transpose of the matrix. 
instead of the right matrix. So um, as I say, I'll, I'll try to correct that for you, but hopefully you've got the idea there. Don't take what I did literally because there's something wrong. Okay, determinants. Now this is moving on into chapter three. Um, in chapter two, we're saving the section on applications and later in the course after we've done a lot of uh, stuff with the matrices um, and you will have seen some applications in the homework uh, then we come back and do the application sections when we have a bigger perspective uh, i find that that tends to work better than just diving into the applications right now you might want to read the section on applications if you have time it gives you uh, that gets the wheels turning on how this stuff is used. And as I say, that um, calculus and linear algebra are the mathematical basis of uh, most engineering. Okay, in computer engineering, there's also discrete mathematics, which is a great subject, which we could teach it. Um, I got to teach it many years ago um, when we actually had a computer science program. And uh, if you're taking calculus uh, with our on campus, you know, our full time mathematics instructor, uh, yeah, he was a student in those courses. Uh, so, uh, neat stuff, but we can't teach it. Okay, well, end of digression. Okay, determinants. Um, I'm just going to define. The determinant of a two by two matrix. Okay. So the determinant of the matrix A11, A12, A21, A22 can be written with something that looks like absolute value symbol. Okay. A11, A12, A21, A22 with something like absolute value signs around it. And that simply equals these numbers multiplied minus the product of these numbers. Okay, so it's a product A11, A22 minus A12, A21. Example, the determinant of the stochastic matrix that we looked at previously is 0.9 times 0.8 minus 0.2 times 0.1, which equals 0.72 minus 0.02 which equals 0 0.70. Now this tells you something important about how that stochastic matrix operates. It tells you that if you multiply the vector No, never mind. Never mind. Okay. Uh, I wrote it real. Yeah. Okay. I got you. It tells you that if you have a set of vectors of equal length around a circle. And you multiply all these vectors by this the, the stochastic matrix, the transition is going to give you an ellipse. Okay, it's going to distort the circle. Um, and 
well, I'm just going to draw an ellipse. Okay. It's not going to look exactly like this. You got an eigenvector in this direction, an eigenvector in this direction, uh, and this eigenvector becomes 70% as long and so forth. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. All I'm going to say is the area, if the area here is one, the area over here is 0 0.70 multiplied by this transition matrix. Now, and obviously, let's see if the lights come back on. They usually do. I don't know what's going on with this. But I suspect that the space heater that I'm running over here in addition to the other things I've got plugged in, is straining the system. But it happened again. I don't think it's happening in the rest of the house. Uh, and I don't know what I'm going to do if it doesn't come back on. Of course, I can go, I'll always go check the switch box. Uh, I've got something here on a breaker. Not helping. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna have to go check the breaker box. Um, and maybe check the rest of the house, see if anything else is off. But this has happened and the clocks are never off. So I think it's just confined to this circuit. The rest of the house is okay. I don't see anything in this breaker box. Uh, it might be the, well, let me play around just a little bit. Uh, give me about two or three more minutes.
Okay, I'm getting there. Uh, I think it's the power strip and I need a flashlight and I've got one, but it doesn't work. I've got a Ryobi flashlight, it's a good to rechargeable battery, but I can't find it. So I'm gonna have to try to replace this power strip uh, without enough light. So uh, I should be able to do that fairly quickly. And really, we don't need to be recording all this, do we? Okay, we had an interruption there. Had, had a power failure. Um, just had to replace a power strip. Took a few minutes. Okay, so we have, again, uh, this definition of the determinant. It's very important. Uh, and another important determinant that's much related to what happens in this two-dimensional configuration with our population vectors, if you're doing a stochastic matrix, two by two stochastic matrix, and it extends into higher dimensions. Uh, this determinant. Now this symbol here is Greek lambda, and you're gonna love it because you're gonna see it a lot before too long. And you're going to see it in some of the problems, okay? Uh, there might even be a problem in your problem set that has matrix of this form that you do a determinant of. So we do this. Well, you multiply this by this, and you multiply this by this, and you subtract what you get here from what you get here. So that equals 0.9 minus lambda times 0.8 minus lambda minus 0.2 times 0.1, which equals lambda squared minus 1.7 lambda uh, plus 0.72 minus 0.02. And that becomes lambda squared plus 1.7, what, just one, one in there, please. Uh, lambda plus 0.72. That 0.70. Um, if you set this equal to zero, you get what's called the eigenvalues of this matrix, which determine how this thing transforms. Once you, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues determine how this unit circle here transforms and gives you the area and so forth. Um, but we're not going to do that. Okay, so anyhow, there we have it. Set it equal to zero. Then by the Pythagorean theorem, lambda is going to be negative 1.7 plus or minus the square root of 2.89 minus 2.80, all that over two. Um, etc. And something is a little bit wrong with that, but we're not going to worry about it. Okay. Something you're going to see that involves determinants. Now, we've got a determinant of a two by two matrix. How do we do a determinant of a larger matrix? A three by three matrix, let's say. Okay, so we'll just use absolute value signs. Now we'll talk more about this next time because the section of determinants is not actually due until a week from today. The only thing that's due uh, on Thursday is going to be the section on stochastic matrices. Okay, so this determinant, it's A11 times the determinant of A22, A23, A32, A33. 
Now there's more. It's A22 times another determinant, and then it's plus A33 times another determinant. Now why is it A12, A22, and A33? Well, actually, it could be any row or column of this matrix, but for now, we're just going to say, okay, it's the first row. That's your A12, A11, your A2, and it's not A22, three, three, it's A12, and A13. The numbers in your first row are the quantities, you know, because sometimes they're symbolic quantities. Uh, in in uh, okay in that row, the numbers here consist of okay this matrix, which is the matrix you get if you eliminate. A11, if you eliminate the row and column of A11. Okay, so there's the matrix you get. If you eliminate the row and column of A12, well, you get these two columns. And they give you this matrix. And if you eliminate, there it is. No, don't want to use that, sorry. If you eliminate the wrong column of A13, that's what goes with this one. And the wrong column of A13 give you this matrix. Okay, so we can easily write that down. Uh, A12, you eliminate the column and the row of A12, and you end up with this and this. So that's going to be A2, column A21, A31, and then A23 and A33. Didn't leave myself enough room to write that as big as I'd like. Hopefully, you can read it, uh, but it's these two columns. And then if I eliminate the row and column of A13, I get A21, A22, A31, A32. And what I've got is I've got a set of permutations of, that, well, I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but you might see some discussion of that in the book. Um, what I end up with when I then expand these matrices using the rule for two matrices, when I calculate the determinant of each of these matrices, I'm going to get a number from every row and every column. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to work that out completely, but I'll go ahead and write out these determinants. This is going to be A11 times A22, A33 minus A23, A32. And that's going to be plus A12 times A21, um, A33 minus A23, A31. Okay, that's A21, A33 here, A23, A31 here. Okay, then it's going to, then it's not plus, it's minus. This is the minus sign. And then it's plus A13 multiplied by A21, A32 minus A22, A31. Okay, now if you look at the products you get out of this, a11, A22, A33, well, that's the numbers in this diagonal. Okay. A11 times A23, A32, A11, A23, A32. 
So I'm selecting a number from each row and each column. And there's a rule as to how this goes. But in any case, that's your matrix. Um, so that's part of the general rule that you use for calculating determinants of larger matrices. And we'll see how that works when an even larger matrix in a minute. Um, not going to give you the entire rule today because uh, you know next time we'll uh, talk a little bit more about determinants and some properties of determinants. But I want to get you introduced to determinants so that we can uh, do that next time. So I'm kind of splitting uh, the three sections that are due next week. I'm kind of splitting those three sections in half, kind of doing half of the section of determinants. Uh, the other half of this section and the next section we'll talk about next time. Okay, well, yeah, what I was gonna say just is, there's a more general rule that allows you to do a similar thing with the first column or the second row or the second column or the third row or the third column being these three numbers. And the rule just depends on the sum of the two subscripts, okay? If the two subscripts add up to an even number, then this is gonna be plus. If the two subscripts add up to an odd number, then this is gonna be minus. Now we're not gonna to try to apply that. I'm not gonna do an example of it right now, but yeah. once you do that, and then you define cofactors, which are these matrices and everything uh, works out kind of nicely. Um, right now, let's just get the rule down so we see how it works, okay. See how my board space is holding up here. I'm gonna have to wash some boards before my next class. Okay. If we have a four by four matrix, and we'll just write one of those down. A11, A12, A13, A14. A21, A22, A23, A24, A31, A32, A33, A34, A41, A42, A43, A44. Okay. We're going to use the same rule we did before. We're going to take the first row. And we're going to multiply that by the matrix we get if we eliminate that row, but the row and column of A11. And that's, of course, going to be A22, A23, A24, A31, A32, A33, A34, A41, A42. I know why I, I, I want to do that. I just want to start counting with one. Um, so I'm writing without thinking. Okay, so there's our first step in expanding this determinant. Well, um, the second step ought to be obvious, but let's just look at what, what's involved here. In order to evaluate this determinant, we've got to do everything we did before. We're going to have to do A22 times this matrix, A23 times these, the matrix consisting of this and this, and A24 times this matrix. Okay? And that's a bit of a mess because we're going to have to evaluate then, just for this one, we're going to have to evaluate six two by two matrices. Three two by two matrices, sorry. Um, and then we're going to have to do the same thing for A12.
is minus A12 times the determinant um, A21, A. Two, three, A, two, four, get the A, three, one, A, three, three, A, three, four, A, four, one, A, four, three, A, four, four. Okay, then we're going to have plus A, one, three times. A determinant. I don't have room to write it all out. The watermark's going to wash stuff out down here, and I don't want to spill it over here. So it's going to be times the obvious matrix that we get. We eliminate the column in the row of A13. And then it's times A14, if you can read that, times. Uh, the determinant, skinny determinant, obviously, uh, that we get when we eliminate the first row and first column. Uh, when we eliminate the row and the column of A14, and it's going to be minus that. And again, notice that we have positive for A11 and A13 because one and one adds up to two, which is even. One and three adds up to four, which is even. And we have minus on these two, because one, two adds up to three, which is odd. And one, four adds up to three, which is also odd. Um, and that's pretty much the rule. Now there's some terminology and, well, there's, there's terminology involved with these things, cofactors and adjoints and all kinds of stuff. I don't think you see adjoints until the fourth section of the chapter, which is an application section, which we're going to defer until a little bit later in the course. Um, okay, some properties of determinants. The determinant of A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Now, don't let these things that look like absolute value signs lead you to believe that determinants are always positive because an absolute value would always be positive. Determinants can easily be negative. And we you know, haven't done an example yet, but it's very easy to see that uh, the product of this diagonal on a two by two matrix uh, would be greater than the product of this diagonal, which would give you a negative. So you have positive or negative. Um, if you do a random matrix, uh, you have equal probability of a positive or negative determinant. Okay, so anyhow, make the, the, the absolute value, the, yeah, yeah, it's an absolute value. Determinant of a product of matrix is just what you'd think the product of the determinant. However, one thing that you wouldn't expect until you thought about it is if you multiply a matrix A by a constant number C, the determinant is not C times the determinant of A, it's C to the N times the determinant of A. This applies where A is an N by N matrix. And let's explore this idea just a little bit. Okay, let's just take the matrix, let's do a stochastic matrix that we had before, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.8. As we saw, 0.72 minus 0 0.02 is 0 0.70. Okay, then what if we multiply it all these numbers, well, let's just double them, okay? So two, I'm just gonna write it down. 
Now there's no longer a stochastic matrix, but that, I just happened to pick the stochastic matrix because it's a good example. Okay, so we have this. Okay, now you can verify that every one of these numbers is a double of the corresponding number up here. So we've doubled our stochastic matrix. 1.8 times 1.6 is what? Well, let's see, I gotta think about, about that a little bit. Uh, 1.6 times 1.6 is 2.56. And then 0.2 times 1.6 is 0.32. So 2.56 and 0.32 is 2.88. Okay, so I think that's 2.88. But that's too much. Okay, 1.8 squared is 3.64. Oh, wait a minute, my logic there. 1.6 times 1.6. Yeah, then we have 0.2 times 1.6. Hmm. Never mind. No? Yeah, yeah, never mind. I was looking for 2.89 for some stupid reason. Okay, and then that's minus 0.08. 0.4 times 0.2 is 0.08. So that's 2.80. And notice that this is four times this. Okay. If A is your stochastic matrix, the one, yes, yeah, same demented matrix. Then 2A is the matrix 1.8, getting hard to write down here, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 1.6. to continue up here. Okay, so the determinant of A is 0 0.70, determinant of 2A is 2.40. So determinant of 2A equals 2 to the second power times the determinant of A, which of course is 4 times the determinant of A. Y2 to the second power. Two to the second is two to the n. Since A is two by two. And this two is what gives us this two. Why did it come out four times as great? Well, because we're multiplying a number here that's twice as big as 0.9 by a number here. Well, look up here. We're multiplying a number here that's twice as big as 0.9 by a number here that's twice as big as 0.2. If I multiply twice this number times twice that number, I get four times the product of those two numbers, and that should be obvious. If I had three rows, then every term would be a product of a number in the first row times a number in the second row times a number in the third row. Okay, at least every, every number that we get in expanding a three by three matrix is gonna include whatever C is as a factor. So that when we add up a bunch of products of three numbers, one from each column, that factor is gonna appear three times. And we're gonna then end up with C to the third, okay? Uh, and that should be kind of obvious. Uh, so I don't want to work it out in too much detail. I want to mention just a couple more properties and then we'll talk more about why the properties are true. But it should be clear to you if you think about it, uh, that if 
every number in here is C times as great. Then since you're always doing products of three of these numbers and then adding them up, uh, the product of three numbers that are all C times as great is C cubed times as great. In other words, if all these numbers were doubled, then we'd have products of three doubled numbers, which would give us a factor of two for each of those numbers. We'd have two to the third times the determinant. So it's kind of important to understand that. Okay. Um, now another I'm going to write this a little more strongly. A row of A is all zeros if and only if. Never mind. That was dumb. Okay, if a row of A is all zeros, then the determinant of A is zero. Since if any row of any matrix. If the row of this matrix is all zeros, the determinant consists of a sum of numbers from first column, second column, third column, fourth column. A sum of products, one from the first, one from the second, one from the third, and one from the fourth column. Okay, well, if all the numbers in the third column are zero, then every product has a zero in it, and you're just going to get zeros. Uh, and notice that if a row of A is all zeros, then A is non-singular. Now, A can be non-singular and not have a row of all zeros. Obviously, if one row is a multiple of another, then you're going to you go you're going to uh, get a determinant of zero. That's obvious for a two by two matrix. Um, okay, so that's that's an important property. If you switch a row and a column, or switch a row and a column, switch two rows, To get a matrix, which we'll call A prime, that's not a derivative. Uh, you can do derivatives of matrices if the matrix consists of functions, okay? But that's not what we're talking about now. Uh, we get a matrix A prime such that the determinant of A prime equals the negative of the determinant of A. Okay, so if you switch two rows, it messes up the subscripts in a way that causes the matrix to have the equal but opposite determinant. Um, the determinant of the transpose of a matrix is equal, well, you can't do the transpose of a determinant. Determinant of A transpose is equal to the determinant of A. And if you take my word for the fact that if you, uh, that, that you can do an expansion on the columns just as well as you can do an expansion on the rows, um, the since the rows become the columns, uh, it works out the same. And you can do that with the subscripts. It's, it's, it's easy to write that out. And it's easy to see that for smaller matrices uh, and generalize that to larger matrices. We'll talk more about that next time. A tran but the determinant of the transpose is equal to the determinant of the matrix. Um, the determinant of the inverse of the matrix is the reciprocal of the determinant of the matrix. Um, 
if you think about a matrix equation, If A is non-singular, I didn't have room to write the whole word there, but non-singular, once you see non-sing, if you can read that, uh, you know what the rest of the word is anyhow. Then X equals A inverse times B. Um, if you had an equation with just numbers, you know that if AX equals B, then X equals B over A. So the A here goes to reciprocal here. You can't do the reciprocal of a matrix, you can do the inverse, but the determinant of the inverse is the reciprocal of the determinant of the matrix. So that the form of this equation uh, makes it look like you ought to have a reciprocal in there some way. You can't do reciprocal of a matrix, but the determinant is the reciprocal. Uh, that's just an analogy, uh, but you can firm that up. And of course, it's easy to prove this. Why is A inverse, the determinant of A inverse equal to the reciprocal of the determinant of A? Well, since A inverse A equals I, and the determinant of your identity matrix is one. And that's real easy to prove. Now you can verify it for yourself. Take my word for it. The determinant of the identity matrix is one. Probably should have mentioned that a little earlier, but there it is. Okay. Well, it follows the determinant of A inverse times A is one. And as we said before, hadn't proved it, but the determinant of the product of two matrices is the product of the determinants. And if the determinant of A inverse times the determinant of A equals one, these are just numbers, determinants are just numbers, we can divide by determinants, then determinant of A equals the reciprocal of the determinant of A inverse. So once you prove that the product of two determinants as a determinant equal to the uh, sorry. The determinant of the product of two matrices is equal to the product of the determinants. You get this. Okay, well, we're out of time. We lost what, five, six, seven minutes to the uh, uh, power strip failure. But that's enough for today. If you digest all that and get at least those ideas into your head, and then, of course, uh, work the section on uh, stochastic matrices. Uh, then you'll be in good shape to go into further discussion of determinants next time, which hopefully will give you what you need in order to uh, understand better and, and work the two sections that'll be due uh, a week from today. Okay, so I have to move on to my next class. If you have questions, please email me. Uh, got an unusually busy morning, which makes the power failure that great because we've got to squeeze an important meeting in between two class consecutive classes. Um, not this one and the next one, but the next one and the following one. So I've got to, got to move on here. Okay, uh, if you have questions, email me uh, and I will uh, hopefully remember to uh, correct what I didn't do right on the uh, stock market transition matrix. Okay, see you next time and glad you were here. You're welcome.